What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Amazing Marketing Minds podcast. Uh, we have Michelle Blazer here with us today. Um, she is the Communications and Strategy Director at Baldwin and. Uh, Michelle has spearheaded several award-winning campaigns throughout her career, and she's even launched one of the first, if not the only, ad strategy newsletter that focuses on cultural trends. So we're super excited to have you here, Michelle. Um, hello. For having me. Hi. This is so exciting. <laughs> of course, we're excited to we're excited to have you. I'm excited about your presentation that's coming up. Thank you. In general, it is a good rainy day here at the Tortuga office. <laughs> I know. Happy winter in Raleigh. Happy, happy winter in Raleigh. Yeah, right. <laughs> at at 60 degrees. <laughs> take that any day. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's why a lot of people come down here. Um, I was going to ask you, Michelle, how does, um, I noticed like on your LinkedIn profile, um, you you started out as a media buyer, I correct? Yeah. A media buyer intern. I'd love to hear more about your journey to become the communication and strategy director. Like, yeah, what was that like? Totally. So I'm from Dallas originally. Um, I went to the University of Texas at Austin for college. Um, I had no idea that advertising was a major, but then I happened upon it when I was trying to get into the communications school. You have to take intro to advertising. Okay. <laughs> Fell in love with advertising. They have a media sequence at UT, which again was awesome. It's kind of like a minor. And okay. so then between my junior and senior year of college, I was like, I have to move to New York, get an internship, just dip my toes. That's see the what thing, it's right? Like. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, gotta make it big in the city. Yeah. of advertising, Times Square. <laughs> and so. Um, anyways, I got an internship at Media Vest on the Walmart account doing media planning and buying. Cool. Um, the office was in Times Square and I thought I was so cool. And then of course, come to find out no one wants to live in Times Square or work in Times Square when you actually are a New Yorker, but that didn't matter. Um, so that was kind of my first entry point, um, into New York and the advertising world. And then after that, I was like, completely sold. So when I graduated, I interviewed at a bunch of places, landed at a job at Wyden and Kennedy um, in New York okay. doing media planning. Still on... in Times Square or no? No, 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 no. They, they're not. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're too cool for Times Square in the best way. <laughs> um, and we, um, or I worked on the ESPN account was my first account that I started cool. on. Yeah. Okay. So it was so much fun. Loved New York. Wyden is an incredible agency, as I'm sure you guys know. Um, and really, I think what I learned there was just thinking outside the box, creativity can come from anywhere. And that really was a great kind of um, launch pad for my career. And so met my husband in New York. Um, he got a job offer in Boston. So we moved up there. Come to find out it's way colder in Boston than in New York. Interesting. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, Boston's cool. I've been to Boston a couple of times. Uh, what our business development guy actually oh, cool. is right now in Vermont, but based out of Boston. Amazing. Well, we moved there the year that it was the record breaking snowfall since 1872. Wow, what a great year. Uh, great year to move there. <laughs> but uh, the good news is that um, I started working at Mullen Low Media Hub. So Mullen, when I started, was just Mullen. They merged with Low. Media Hub is okay. the media arm inside of Mullen Low. Right. Um, and that was super cool because they were kind of building their practice at the time. So it's really able to kind of help shape from scratch. Shape that. Yeah, that's really yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, and so with my entertainment experience, I worked on ESPN and ABC um, at Wyden. And so I started out on the TV land account at Media Hub. And then about a year, year and a half into the job, Netflix called us to see if we were interested in pitching the business. And obviously we said yes. <laughs> um, and so that was incredible because it was a small pitch team. Like I was in the room. Um, we won two projects. So we worked on Grace and Frankie season two and Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt were our first two campaigns, which were super fun. That's so cool. It was great. And it's so funny because like Grace and Frankie is one of those shows. Have you watched it before? My uh, my wife, Melissa, is okay, really big into it. the show. Yeah, it's one of those shows where you're like, oh, it's about like old ladies, but it's totally not. Like I everything walk in, in the show. I walk into the weirdest scenes. Yeah. Like I'm, I walk into the room and the weirdest things are happening. It's very inappropriate <laughs> in the best way. <laughs> um, so that was kind of the starting point of figuring out this kind of new practice that we were developing. And so custom research was a huge part of it. Um, communications planning was kind of how I started to dip my toes between the media planner world and comms planning world. Sure. Um, and then we built that business from a few projects. The next year we had 70 campaigns. Um, it's kind of at the same time that Netflix was developing all of their original content. So okay. um, I helped launch Stranger Things, which is so fun. Wow. Did um, you meet any of the people? Yeah, I got to meet them at That's some so of the cool. different like 
at Comic-Con and a few different places. So a lot of our viewership for TMC uh, covers kind of a broad spectrum in yeah. the marketing space from both entry level to, yep. you know, you know, CEOs, agencies. But for those not familiar with what like a pitch team does, yeah. I, I'm definitely curious to hear like, what did you have to do when Netflix first came to you guys? Yeah, that's what a great that question. Like? Um, so the pitch process is different at every agency and every agency kind of has a different approach. But I think what we did that was um, different is really challenging the clients and, you know, a client briefs you and they say, this is the case, this is our data, this is our target audience, and this is what we want you to do. And not to say at all that th that isn't valuable, it is, of course, but sometimes an outsider perspective with fresh eyes can bring something new to the table and different thinking. Absolutely. And so one of the things that was big for um, that pitch was kind of redefining who they're going after from a target audience perspective. And so this is when I really fell in love with like data and custom research, which if you read The Pollinator, you know, lots of charts, lots of deep dives. <laughs> um, but it was really cool because one of the big things that we found, you know, so for Grace and Frankie, older target audience, female, 50 plus, they were telling us that that should be our focus. And so um, what we found in our research, though, was that actually, you know, there is kind of a cutoff from a technology perspective. Some people, if um, you know, if they don't know what a smart TV is or how to access Netflix, that might not be the first place to start with Correct. the marketing of the campaign. Yeah. Not to say those people aren't valuable and we shouldn't build it into our strategy long term, but for making a buzzworthy impact um, in that first moment for launching the campaign. Different target audience. Exactly. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah so I... we honed it in and they thought that was super interesting. And that actually is what we ended up implementing, too, which was really cool because we were actually... A lot of times in a pitch, like what you present isn't necessarily what, what ends up comes happening. to life. Yeah, yeah but it, it kind of was, which was cool. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, you're right. It doesn't. It's not always that clear cut and clean. So totally. that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. So that was awesome. Um, and then uh, I'm trying to think. Oh yeah. So like over the course of working on that account, we um, launched Stranger Things, The Crown. We launched their first blockbuster film, Bright, with Will Smith. If yes. anybody saw I've it, I've seen it. I've seen it. It's a cool it, movie. It's a great movie. Got lots of bad press, but also lots of good press. <laughs> and it was one of their most viewed movies. So in my opinion, probably did well. What is interesting about that landscape is Netflix is very much pushing against the world of like, obviously they want, um, you know, really important people like at the Oscars to take them seriously. But sometimes a blockbuster film isn't necessarily Oscar worthy. Like sure, those worlds. Absolutely. Um, and so it's about the story. Yeah. But it was great because like who did it like that movie was really great in its own right. And so that was kind of the first foray into films for them, which is exciting because they actually got the most Oscar noms this year that just got released yesterday. So building that That's book exciting. for them was cool. Um, and so, yeah, we um, one of the campaigns that got a bunch of awards was Narcos season two. That was a really fun one to work on. Um, good we, reason. Good reason. That's yeah. another one that I'm a big fan. Of. I, I love this. I know all these shows. I know. And <laughs> it's so fun. I, entertainment's an interesting world because like, obviously, it's a very consumer facing world. And so it's fun to get behind the scenes. Um, it's funny because they send you over the content before it has any of the special effects or anything in it. So when yep. we were watching season one of Stranger Things, it's like Demogorgon goes here. And then, you know, <laughs> it has like VFX effect here. And so as a consumer, I was like, what is this show? I don't understand. <laughs> and then once it launched that we're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Completely different. It was, yeah, it was so cool. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think one of the big things, and I'm going to touch on this a lot in our talk at the Triangle Marketing Club, but how to turn trends into brand momentum. I think one fundamental huge takeaway in all of the years I worked on the Netflix account was making sure that you are aligning anything that you're doing from a marketing perspective in the world of a cultural moment. So having that as an anchor for a campaign, for your target audience, understanding who your target is, what they care about, and then how is that relevant to whatever yes. you're launching, whether it's LaCroix soda or if it's a TV show or if it's a B2B product at the end of the day. When there's some sort of cultural trend or swell happening, there's existing conversation that you can tap into instead of, which often happens when marketing or advertising agencies go off to come up with ideas. Oftentimes you're trying to develop something out of nothing or in a vacuum. Absolutely. And so yeah. if you can tap into something that is already existent, then the there's a larger opportunity for earned media and to catch on. Uh, yeah, there's there's a couple of other strategies I've read about um, that kind of follow the same concept. Instead of trying to, I think uh, uh, like Spencer's behind the camera was telling me about Bill Gates. Um, kind of always starts with a why. Mm, reminds totally. me reminds me of uh, 
of, of using cultural trends to be yeah. able to, to make those decisions because yeah. you're, you know, sure they sell computers, but even before getting to selling the computer, first they identified why and who and yes. all that really important stuff yes. in order to get to the That actually, the I'm going to jump forward a little bit, but lived in Boston. My husband started a company. <laughs> we moved to Raleigh. I work at Baldwin Inn now, as you mentioned. Yep. Yep. That's a huge tenet of what we do. So we're a brand behaviors agency. And what that means is essentially we brand from the in- inside out. So we start with the why. We start with the mission and the purpose and the belief system of a brand. Mm-hmm. And then we work outward. So then what does the style look of the brand and the voice and the personality? And then what would the advertising campaign look like? So whereas often clients start with the external communications, but really advertising yes, should be yeah. a reflection of who the brand is and what they stand for, right? That makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, most of the time, you're not the only one selling or uh, promoting that one particular service totally, or product. Totally. But you're the only person that's going to appeal to your audience, your yes. true fans. So that that makes perfect right. sense. Well, and I think the whole thing is like, sure, you can sell a product all day long. You can create buyers. Yeah. But to create buy-in, you require something different. And so if a brand is standing mm. for something and has a mission or a purpose or a belief system that everything is laddering up to, then you give the audience an opportunity to buy into a holistic kind of lifestyle and um, something that helps mirror their own beliefs versus just saying like, oh, cool, like I got another thing. You know? Yeah. What uh, Can you give us any examples of uh, maybe like brands that you've worked with that yeah. you're able to share where you've done that? Or yeah, like just that's a great idea. Give people insight? No, totally. Um, I'm trying to think of which one I'm going to pick. Uh, let's see. Do you want to talk? Okay, Long John Silvers is a brand. Okay, cool. That we're yeah, working. everybody knows them. <laughs> um, I'm going to Louisville's today, actually, for a presentation tomorrow. Um, nice. So, what's interesting about Long John Silvers? They came to us. They're like, we're kind of a forgotten brand. Um, our sales are down. We have a lot of competition, and we need help. And so, instead of the original project, with that was asking us to come up with a campaign. We right, said, okay, right. we can do that absolutely. But what we really think we should do is start with a little bit further back in the process. Let's start with branding and understanding what Long John Silvers brings to the table that no one else does and what you guys believe in and stand for that is so important that then can help us set the stage for figuring out what our campaign should be. So through a lot of brand immersion, interviews, but not just with like the marketing team, also like the head chef, people who work in the store. Long story short, one of the big kind of things that we uncovered that existed in the core of the brand was the fact that their mission from day one, 50 years ago when Jim Patterson started the company, was to bring the unique seaside experience to everyone across the country. And so that really started to help us focus and help them focus on where they should be heading. One of the things that they found, they're like, you know, chicken is selling really well for us. Chicken is having a moment. Look at all of these new companies popping up. This was before the chicken sandwich wars, but still (laughs) chicken was having a moment. And, um, you know, after, so that was a question we were considering, like should Long John Silver's become a company that doesn't just offer fish? But after we went through this whole immersion and our whole process in our brand blueprint, which is really like the core product that we sell, one of the big stakes in the ground that we made was this is the original mission of the company. Like you guys should double down on that and be the purveyors of seafood, like own fish. You guys can do fish all day long and you should own fish and right. like no one else can compete. Sure, there's like Captain D's, there is Red Lobster, but like what Long John Silver's is doing their um, practice of like how they source their fish is extremely sustainable. Like they have all of these different methods of creating like why their fish is the best fish, but that people don't know about it. And so the fact that we were able to kind of uncover their original mission helped us chart a path forward to figure out then how should the voice come to life. So what's really That's- fun is we've developed this, um, the personality that we call um, like our social voice. Go follow them on Twitter if you're interested, but it's Buddy <laughs> the Sea Elf. So Buddy it's like okay, undeniably cool. naively obsessed with the ocean instead of being obsessed with Christmas. Um, <laughs> and so any conversation related to the sea or ocean or not, we turn into a moment for um, the brand. So what we say is like our strategy is to trigger the seafood mood um, by seafying everything. And so that's really 
again, maps back to the core purpose and mission of the company. Like, had we not started there, we might not be in the same place that we are. Absolutely. Wow. That's, I mean, that that's incredible. It makes sense. It makes sense how you got from point A to point B. How does, uh, what does a like, communications director do in that, in that yeah, scenario? Yeah, that's like, a great question. Um, it's interesting. Communications planning or engagement planning or connections planning even has a lot of different names and everyone defines it very differently. Okay. So, <laughs> um, but Ultimately, the crux of what communications planning is, is bridging the gap between creative and media. Um, but I think in our point of view at Baldwin and a brand is a set of behaviors based off of the belief system. And so whether or not you're advertising where a brand should exist and how it should behave should start with the core of the of the company. And so for me, for comps planning, what we're developing is kind of like a new thing where I'm not just looking at paid channels right. where the creative could run. I also am looking at like what are the other environments that a, this brand should be existing in. So, for if you're a salad chain, like what if you had stickers on your bowls, or if you're a tech company, like should you launch a Slack channel? Like even though those things may not be something that you can actually buy. Absolutely, yeah. It's just another form of content marketing. Yeah, basically. exactly. There you go. <laughs> I like it. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. It's 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 nice to hear how you went from point of view, and and I think it's super inspiring for people who who mm. kind of want to follow in your footsteps yeah. and do oh, that I appreciate kind of thing. That. Um, and before we shift into like talking a little bit about your presentation, yeah. Um, like, what would you say to people who are basically you when you were in college, mm. like? Any bit of advice that might be helpful yeah. because you you had a pretty pretty successful career uh, and you've you've done a lot. So how can people how can people try to replicate that? That's really sweet of you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would say I mean one thing that I felt was extremely impactful on my career was really developing strong relationships with my professors. Okay, um, that was something that was hugely helpful along the way. Um, my professor, Dr. Murphy, who is one of the main guys to help create the advertising program at UT, nominated me for the internship program that sent me to New York. So oh, that was a huge thing. Yeah, he thing. played a huge role yeah, in that. Yeah, totally. That's cool. Um, but then I think also like every at every company, just always raising your hand and asking for more opportunity is something that I think goes a, a really long way. And so, for example, like, of course, like get your media planner job done, but raise your hand to work on the new business pitch, raise your hand to write Absolutely. the case study, raise your hand to help the production team out. Like there's always an opportunity to learn. I think when I was starting out, it was very like bifurcated. Like there's traditional planners and digital planners. It's like before like the integrated planner thing came to be. Yep. But what I realized is like, the way that people consume media is like, you don't think about it in like this vertical or that vertical. You just, you're a person and you just use things based on like what's useful to you. Right. And so as an advertiser or marketer or anybody in the space media, like you need to understand that, right? So like starting with the audience, but then also making sure that your career can encapsulate all of that learning. So I just wanted to have the most well-rounded, like 360 degree experience I could. So from digital to traditional, like everything, as much as I can get my hands on. Um, <laughs> because I think it's important, like as we continue progressing, like TikTok didn't exist two years ago, it you know? No, and so didn't. now there's like probably somebody dedicated to TikTok at some company or brand at this point. Absolutely. You know? And it's leading, I mean, we were talking about trends, like TikTok is leading the way in a lot of cultural trends and, mm -hmm. and things that are shaping who we are as a, you know, for all the upcoming generations. It's audiences. so fascinating. My coworker is telling the story about how his daughter who's in high school was watching TikTok and all of a sudden he looks over and he's like, is that Gary Vaynerchuk? And she was like, yeah. She's like, how do you know him? <laughs> and he was like, uh, how, <laughs> how do you mean you how know did him? I know him? Right. right. But the whole point is like, there is like a, an entirely new world and opportunity for brands and marketers to engage with a new group of people who, as we know, Gen Z is like a very up, up and coming, large, powerful segment of the population. But that being said, I would not say TikTok is necessarily the right strategy for every brand. Of, oh, course, of course, you need to yeah. know like, who is your audience? What media are they consuming? But if you're looking to grow up with a new generation, it could be a great opportunity. Absolutely. It's just, you guys do a lot with that uh, as part of your strategy now, or is it becoming part of your strategy? It's a good question. Currently right now, none of our brands exactly exist in the space of Gen Z quite yet, but it's something that we do monthly inspiration sessions at Baldwin yep. and where we're putting a TikTok presentation together just to say like, it's kind of like a get smart, like this yeah, is what absolutely. it is, this is how you use it. And what's fun about this territory, which I think kind of maps back to like kind of what I learned on the Netflix account, but very much about like 
when a platform or a product doesn't have like a measurement system, like you can't measure a reach and frequency on TikTok yet that I'm aware of, that's actually the best because that's when you can make it into your own. That's when you can hack the system, create a new thing. Like right now, obviously, like dance challenges are huge. What's going to be the next yeah. thing a month from now? Things change so fast, right? right and so absolutely. using those platforms and tools kind of as your creative palette, I think is something that's really important to keep in mind, especially when it's nascent. Because, you know, a year or two from now, there's going to be a lot more regulations. There's going to be a lot more kind of probably stringent ad offerings and all the stuff. Whereas, and also right now, probably, I don't know this, but I would guess that the organic reach is way higher right now. Yeah. We just and like a, a few we, years from now, probably not going yeah, to be. It's just like the early days into it. We actually yeah. just released a video specifically no about organic reach on Wait, on tell me. What was yeah. it? Well, well, just like you, like, yeah. we don't have a lot of brands that, you know, their target audience is 100% on TikTok. Yeah. But as marketers, it's our responsibility to be aware of what's Absolutely. going on in the industry and what totally. it's being used for. And one of our videos was titled, you know, or like about the organic reach on TikTok. That is we, so interesting. We redid our entire, uh, we're actually working on rebranding our uh, Tortuga image and everything. And um, we, this was the first video posted to our new YouTube channel. Cool. Uh, just educating people on the opportunity. That's um, awesome. So it's just like free advice. If your brand is looking to reach that target audience, this is something you should look at because the reach is incredible right now. Yeah, it is but, crazy. Um, and like every celebrity is on it and every high schooler. I feel like every day there's a new person joining. <laughs> it's insane. And this is like maybe more of a side note, but I think from a cultural context, it's really interesting. I read this article the other day about how all of a sudden everybody has a look into like every middle America and or just like house across the country of just like a normal person in America. What does their house look like? And everyone was commenting about <laughs> like the furniture yeah. and like it all kind of had the same like aesthetic which is just it's fascinating but it really is a peek behind the scenes it is it really people's is lives and what i find interesting is like right now everybody like used to back in the day you really like your cultural context was something that was like very local or like what you saw on tv and now with all these platforms it's like even with Instagram in a way, like as we know, it's very curated, but yeah. like TikTok is a look inside someone's real life. And so like a high schooler in Raleigh can see a high schooler in LA and see what's up, but also like somebody in, I don't know, a different country, Europe Absolutely. somewhere. You yeah. know? And people are finding and instantly connecting with yeah. a lot of similarities. Like yeah. there's a lot of trends specifically on, you know, people in North Carolina yeah. and, and people will post a video about all the cool things in totally. North Carolina. And then it goes and viral it because on, everybody's yeah, like, right. wow, that's me too. I, I know. Did the exact I same love thing. it. So it's interesting because the question I've been asking is like, is culture going to become flat? And I don't know Ooh. because are people going to start like copying or being influenced by the same influences across the country? So where like local influences and subcultures are going to rise, like are going to kind of conflate and become similar? Or is that going to spawn more kind of subcultures? based off of something that you like a shared interest like or whatever. Almost like online cultures. Yeah. I don't know. That's an I think interesting concept. There's, it, it's definitely not a yes or no question by any means. There's probably something in the middle and, or something I haven't thought of, but I don't know. I think it's kind of fascinating. That's a really fascinating topic because, I mean, culture's, you know, created by the separation that people experience, yeah. you know, like you're, you're so far away from each right. other, but that's being removed every right. day. So. so that's what I try to dig into in the <laughs> pollinators. Questions like that or trends like in the media landscape of just kind of things that I've seen like worlds combining i think from my background like doing media planning i love the media landscape and yep. i realize like the brand planner world often um looks at cultural context but forgets media context and vice versa Correct. media planners kind of sometimes can forget like what's going on in culture and so what i realized like just through my experience of like all of those things affect each other you know and it's interesting right, to see right. and it's not always so easy to see what was like the input versus the output I think most of the time it's all kind of like a compound kind of effect. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyways, that's what I dig into on the pollinator. It's, I was getting ready fun. to ask you yeah. about this. So tell us, um, because a lot of people don't know what that yeah. is, right? So tell us about the pollinator. Yeah. Okay. So it's a newsletter for strategists um, about trends happening at the intersection of culture, media, and consumer behavior. And so what that looks like is, you know, recently I wrote an article about um, podcasts and then Next week, I'm going to write about sober curiosity. Um, there's a cool. kind of low to no alcohol trend going on that's not just dry January. It's happening um, like across the whole year, which, like, God help me. I don't think I could do that, but respect <laughs> to everybody who, who does. Um, but, yeah, so it really runs the gamut about, um, you know, what are people 
kind of consuming, but also feeling like last week I wrote about setting goals and how resolutions might be a little bit um, not as successful for a lot of different reasons. And like, sure. what does a goal, ses- goal setting system look like for you personally, but also in the culture of your company? Right, right. Um, so anyways, yeah, yeah it's we're fun. we're in the process of that now, too. Oh, nice. What, um, what is, is that, a, is that a Baldwin thing or is that a you thing, the um, pollinator? The pollinator is a me thing, okay. um, but Baldwin Ann and I definitely collaborate Absolutely, when yeah. possible, when and where possible. But yeah, it kind of started out of this desire. I love writing. I used to write a newsletter for Netflix. It was du- it was very different. Cool. It wasn't long form. But when I started in Raleigh, A, I had a lot more time on my hands because like the world moves at a normal pace here, which is really nice. Um, <laughs> and B, I was wanting to pick back up doing a newsletter. Selfishly, it helps keep me informed of just like what's new, what's going on. It's created so many fun connections. Like uh, we wouldn't be talking otherwise, this is true. you yeah, know. This would not be happening. That's um, and so like moving to a new market where I didn't know a ton of people, I really made it a a huge effort to get connected in this space, both from a work perspective, but also, you know, a friend perspective. Um, Oh, it's nice to have people that you have other things in common. Yeah, totally. Can can vent about. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Right, exactly. Um, That's pretty cool. Well, without giving any details away, can you give us a little preview as to this is uh, the plan is hopefully this is going to be released before your big presentation at the Triangle Marketing Club. Um, give us a little snippet, yeah. a preview. Like, why should people come? What are you going to talk about? Because it's going to be amazing. Thing? You should. You should come <laughs> no. because it's just going to be amazing. <laughs> I'm yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so we're going to talk about how to turn trends into brand momentum. And where I'm going to start is kind of establishing why trends are important in the first place. Okay. And then I'm going to take everybody through the evolution of a trend um, from micro trend to macro trend to cultural trend to movement. Like, what are the stages that it goes through so that everybody can be informed um, to know, like, if this is a trend, like, where is it in the stage to be able to jump onto it? You know, if it's a micro gotcha. trend, how do you interact with it um, versus if it's kind of a movement? Like, where does your brand play a role there? And so I'm using athleisure as an example to go through, which is so interesting. I was thinking about this the other day, but like, remember when yoga pants were like, bad to wear out like there was like a whole yoga pants like epidemic where people like you cannot (laughs) wear these to school or to church or wherever and now Mm -hmm. it's like insane how like the athleisure trend is like definitely taken off it's like here to stay so anyways i'm going to use that as the kind of example to walk through um so that people can know how to identify where a trend is in its stage but then also some kind of road signs and warning signs so as we all know like a trend for me could be way different for you it could be happening to us in the same way but we could be perceiving it differently um i make the joke and i'm going to talk about this but like when the elections happened um everyone in the boston office where i was working was crying that Trump won, but then like my newsfeed from my friends from Texas, like a lot of them were like (laughs) congratulatory. And so it's really interesting because like the political movement, like uh, this is an election year, like obviously it's something that um, everyone everyone is experiencing. In a completely different way. But in a completely different way. Sounds like every family get together. (laughs) Exactly. So, but like as a strategist, you need to know that because if you are writing a brief and the kind of cultural moment you're trying to attach the brand to is something that maybe your audience doesn't like, that's a miss, you know? Absolutely. Oh my goodness. That sounds really exciting. Well, if if, if you're not convinced yet, I don't know how you're going to be convinced, <laughs> but you should definitely attend the event. Uh, it's going to be really informative. Um, and I mean, we could talk about a ton of stuff. I know, this is so um, fun. But I think uh, I think we're we're up on time. Um, where can people find you? How can they connect with you? Great Tell question. us all about the pollinator. Where can okay. they find that? It's www.thepollinator.com. It's the p o l l i n a t r. Cool. It's both to sound super cool and trendy and techy, and also because the <laughs> URL wasn't available <laughs> for the whole word. Um, and then you can follow me on Instagram at the pollinator and then connect with me on LinkedIn. I love chatting with people and like getting coffee and whatever. So you're incredibly fun to talk to. Oh, so thanks. definitely take her up <laughs> on the too. offer. <laughs> um, but that wraps up another episode of the amazing uh, Marketing Minds podcast. If you have any questions, suggestions, leave it in the comments and I'll catch you guys all next time. Thanks, guys.